We've got a wonderful conversation today. It's Wombat Wednesday, so a, a wombat-themed conversation coming to you from Queensland. Wombats are an Australian icon, but many people are not aware that there are several different species. There are three different species of wombats in Australia. The most widespread is the common wombat, and that's one that if you live in the southeastern part of the country, you're most likely to have come across. They've also got a southern smaller cousin, the southern hairy-nosed wombat, and the third species, the rarest species of wombat from Queensland, the northern hairy-nosed wombat. This is a critically endangered species, and to hear all about the animal and also the work that AWC has been involved in trying to conserve this very rare big burrowing mammal, I'm joined today by ecologist Andy Howe. Thanks for joining us, Andy. No worries. Thanks for having me. Andy's based with the AWC team in Cairns, working across the Northeast region. And for longtime watchers of AWC in conversation, you might actually recall way back in the dark days of 2020, uh, during lockdowns, I think we spoke to Andy. And that time it was about the bushfires, wasn't it, Andy? Yeah, that's right. And uh, catching koalas, um, from in front of the flames and then restoring them back to an area in the Blue Mountains after those fires had receded. So Andy has great experience working with a, a lot of different animals. But Andy, today I'd like to talk about this very special cousin of the koala, the northern hairy-nosed wombat. So to start off with, tell us about how this animal is different to those other wombats that people might have seen. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess the um, the first thing that needs to be pointed out about northern hairy-nosed wombats is that they are the largest burrowing mammal in the world. So um, an adult wombat can, you know, be up to about 35 kilos and just over a metre in length. So they're quite big animals. They're not the tallest, but they're quite long and, and really stocky. Um, and I, I guess one of the other really important things about these guys that separates them from the other two species is that they're critically endangered and then their numbers are critically low. So at the moment, the population estimate for these, for the entire world, is about 315. So, um, you know, the, the common wombat and the southern hairy-nosed wombat obviously have a lot more than that in their populations, but these guys, you, you know, they're, they're critically low in numbers um, and that, you know, that's one of the reasons why AWC is being involved with their conservation in that, you know, we can help progress them and create new populations where we can hopefully build on that population. So critically endangered, quite a bit bigger than other wombats. So I think like 32 kilos on average. So that's a really big, big animal, especially one to be digging burrows. They're relatively long lived. I believe they can live up to 28 years. So that's, that's quite old for animals living in the wild. And as you mentioned, critically endangered. So really interesting creatures and I guess quite difficult to study seeing as they live and spend a lot of their time underground is that right? Yeah that's right I guess behaviorally uh, the difference between the northern hairy nose and the southern hairy nose and the common wombat is that they're a lot more cryptic um, they're extremely shy and that makes studying and researching these animals really difficult because you know they they don't like change they don't like human presence um, so whenever you're working out in the field with these guys, um, you know, there've been staff that have worked with the Northern Hairy Nose Wombats for a number of years and have, were yet to see a wombat in the wild. So, you know, it, it can take many years to even see one with your own eyes. Um, they're a little bit more forgiving when it comes to things like camera traps and, and, and that, but in terms of physically seeing them, it's a really rare and special event. Um, so yeah, I mean, to, they're not accessible by everyone. They're in extremely highly protected areas. Um, and they're only found in two locations in one in central Queensland and one in Southern Queensland. I'll just bring up a, a map showing their distribution. Cause I think that's important to see. And like a lot of mammals, they've declined from, you know, the area where they would have been found uh, previous to European colonization. So this map shows the three different wombat species in Australia. The pale shaded areas are sort of historical or pre-European distribution and the darker areas for each species show where they live now. Just talk us through those two locations where northern hairy nose wombats are found now, Andy. Yeah, sure. So you can see that, that slightly darker red pinky dot in central Queensland. That was the only known population of northern hairy nose wombats uh, in the 1980s. And so that's Epping Forest National Park. 
it's a scientific reserve that has um, no public access and is, is heavily protected. So that was the, the one and only population that existed. And then that other second smaller dot in the, the southern Queensland area there is the Richard Underwood Nature Refuge. So um, the Queensland government decided that it's too risky to have all these wombats in one place. So we're gonna try and find a, a new suitable location and they settled on Richard Underwood. And so a few wombats were translocated there um, in 2008, 2009. And so that's created a, a smaller second population. Thank you. And I guess, you know, as with other species that AWC's worked with, it's a risk when population numbers get that low. I think you said, was it 315 at the estimated population at the moment? That's very, very low numbers for any wild animal species. I think our last webinar was talking about the bilby and just on AWC sanctuaries, we've got well over 3000 now. So, you know, this is an animal right on the brink of extinction. At those really low population levels, there are other risks that come into play. So I guess, you know, there's the fact of, you know, being genetically related means that there are additional risks from disease. A, a single disease could potentially wipe out one of those populations. And also, I, I guess it's all having all your eggs in one basket. So at Epping Forest, you know, the risk of one big fire or one big, you know, flooding event having an impact on that population it's really sort of high stakes when you've only got one site. So you can see the importance of establishing that, that second site. Andy, have you been to Epping Forest where that last remaining population survives? Unfortunately, no, I haven't been to Epping Forest yet. Um, we've had some other AWC staff members head there last year to conduct the hair census, which is how we determine the population of Epping Forest based on the genetic work. But I've spent a lot of my time down at uh, Richard Underwood Nature Refuge. Fantastic. So that was, as you said, the second site where a population was established around 2009. What's the situation there? So, so how many animals do we think are at that second site? And can you describe the landscape to us a little bit? What, what's the sort of habitat that these animals like? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, their historic distribution and their current distribution is in that kind of west of the Great Divide, which is represented both at Epping and at Richard Underwood. They like these open, uh, open woodland landscapes with a grassy understory. And um, so you can see there in the video, this is Richard Underwood Nature Refuge. And one of the key parts or components of their habitat requirements is really deep sandy soils. And they require those for their, to dig their burrows. Because they're such a large animal, they have to dig quite deep. And we think that the depth of their burrows allows them to maintain relative consistent levels of temperature and humidity throughout the year. So um, some of the burrows, have been measured down to three and a half to four meters, which for a big animal and you know they, ha they have to excavate quite a lot of soil. So yeah, this is Richard Underwood. Um, it's really good burrowing habitat for the northern hairy nose wombats there. And at the moment, the population estimate is um, we don't know exactly how many there are, but we think about about fifteen right. within the reserve at the moment. And is it expected that the population there? could grow? Could that site sustain a higher number of wombats or is it close to the capacity of that area? Yeah, so the, the information to date is that it could potentially have a few more wombats in there. there there's space for wombats to grow. Um, and there has been breeding over the years within Richard Underwood. So some of those juveniles that have been bred within that refuge are now coming up to maturity age. Um, and so they would be looking to continue to breed within that enclosure as well. Of course, one of the threats to this species, like many others in parts of inland Australia, has been loss of habitat. And you can see here, you know, even surrounding the refuge areas that have been cleared for agriculture, um, I guess looking at that range map that we saw earlier, you know, that's right in that Brigalow belt west of the Great Divide in Queensland through New South Wales and, and right down towards Victoria, areas that have lost a lot of that uh, native vegetation. Has that been the major threat that's caused wombats to decline or are there others? Yeah, for sure, especially with the northern hairy nose wombat, um, you know, early colonisation of these grazing, you know, prime grazing land. So uh, the habitat destruction and fragmentation uh, historically was a, a really big threat as well as uh, the competition with the stock that came with that grazing. So 
um, you know, cows, sheep, goats eat the same food that wombats eat. Um, I, but, but I guess in more current times, um, a big threat for these guys is things like weeds. So um, buffalo grass is a, um, a, a grazing species that um, is, is good for cattle grazing and um, holds nutrition at other times of the year where the native grasses aren't so nutritious. So um, that's spreading throughout their range and both at Epping and at Richard Underwood. Um, so that not only replaces their natural diet of native grasses, um, to date it, a bit of work's been done on that and it doesn't seem to have had a major health impact as far as we know. But the other thread that comes with buffalo grass is that because it grows a lot thicker and a lot more denser, it's a really big fire risk. So, um, you know, when we only have two populations of wombats, um, a, a big fire could potentially wipe out all of their food resources. Um, so that's something that, you know, has to be managed in terms of, of that. Um, in terms of disease, there hasn't been too much of concern in, in terms of that. Um, to date, there's been no detection of mange within northern hair nose wombat populations, which is something that's more prevalent in the other two species. So that's, so that's, that's really encouraging. We've had a couple of people asking questions about that, actually. And mange, um, it's, it's caused by a mite, isn't it? So it's this uh, horrible condition that yep. spreads between wombats um, where it causes lesions to the skin. Eventually they go blind, really horrible sort of suffering for animals that are affected. But that's great to hear that this species, northern hairy nose wombats, haven't detected mange. Yeah, that's that's sure. And, you know, we, we try and um, follow biosecurity protocols that, you know, when we're working in these areas that we try and really limit, you know, the potential threat of that coming into a population. Um, but I guess, you know, ad additional threats uh, their isolation, the genetic inbreeding potential um, with only having two populations, especially at Richard Underwood being a small population. So um, managing genetics is, a, is another, um, I guess, move that we have to take on, to, on board. Uh, and also looking to increase the number of populations of Northern Hairy Nose Wombat throughout their historical range as well. Okay, so there's the, the conservation challenge, I guess, and that leads nicely into what I'd like to talk about next. AWC has been brought on board. So we've partnered with the Queensland Government and with the Wombat Foundation, which is a really terrific uh, advocacy group for this species and for conservation of wombats more broadly. They've done lots of work over the years to raise the profile of this species. Um, including Hairy Nosed Day, which uh, was <laughs> a few weeks ago. If people haven't heard of it, please get on board for Hairy Nosed Day 2024. So Andy, AWC has joined efforts to conserve this species. What do we bring? What's the expertise that we can offer? And what are some of the priorities for restoration of this species across its historical range? Yeah, sure. So I guess, you know, it's, it's no secret that AWC has a lot of experience dealing with endangered species in fenced areas. Um, so at the moment, the two populations are behind fences um, to protect them from threats. Um, so we can bring a lot of expertise in terms of that field. And then I guess moving forward, um, we're definitely looking at partnering with the Queensland government and the Wombat Foundation and looking into new areas of potential habitat where we can look to establish more populations of the Northern Hairy Nose Wombat because moving forward, you know, Epping Forest National Park has increased to over 300 wombats. You know, if their trajectory continues the way that it is, we'll probably have to look at moving some of those wombats out because there's a limited space for those. You know, in the future, the, the goal is to create multiple populations of a certain size throughout their historical range. So. Um, at the moment, one of my jobs is to look for potential habitat further afield within Queensland and also further into that Riverina area of southern New South Wales, where um, historically there seems to be, you know, higher densities of northern hairy nose wombats in that area. And I, I remember we've talked about this before, but um, just tell us about some of the records we've got for wombats historically, because there's some shocking um, accounts of not only the density, but the persecution of this species in those areas. Yeah, sure. So there's a little bit of information that you can pull out of old newspaper um, articles and 
even um, I guess like early explorer diaries moving through those areas and um, you know no other animal creates such a large burrow system with the very identifiable footprints that they leave it looks like a, a small child's footprints running through the sand so yeah historically especially in that southern um, riverina area of new south wales there's an account from uh, a single property within 12 months that it was estimated that over a thousand northern hairy nosed wombats were killed on that single property and I, I guess that the sad thing about that story is that it wasn't the wombats themselves that you know people had an issue with it was that the, the rabbit boom was happening at the time and they saw that the rabbits were utilizing the wombat burrows for shelter so if we get rid of the wombat burrows and the wombats inside of them suffer um, then hopefully we'll you know put a, a, a limit on the spread of the, the rabbits at the time so unfortunately they were a consequence of that action for another species um, that we had introduced so it's a really sad story that um, you know, on a single property in, in a 12 month period, the, that number of animals was was killed when, you know, all this time later, we are, we're only still talking about just over 300 remains. Yeah, that's shocking. It's heartbreaking to hear that. There's similar figures for other species. Just that I think what we often forget is the abundance of wildlife that, that would have been around, you know, not that long ago, a couple of hundred years ago or less. Um, yeah certainly the case for northern hairy nose wombats in those parts of its range now there are none in that riverina area so you said that one of the priorities is establishing new populations that makes sense and awc's got the track record of translocations and wildlife reintroductions we've done a couple just in the last week that people might have seen um including up in the northeast where you are andy working with betongs so reintroducing them to a new site might sound straightforward, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done initially to scope out areas with the right habitat. So what are some of the considerations that you're looking at now at the current sites to try and work out where might be suitable locations for translocation? Yeah, sure. So at the moment, um, we're partnering with DS and the Wombat Foundation in doing a, a, a small research project on trying to understand how the wombats dig their burrows and uh, how deep are the burrows, how extensive are those burrows. And, you know, we have a criteria at the moment as to what determines suitable northern hairy nose wombat habitat, um, not just above ground, but below ground is really critically important as well with that soil structure. So we're using projects like that to learn what wombats prefer, and then we can apply that information where we're looking further afield um, you know, in their historical range. The biggest and hardest, I guess, factor at the moment is looking for the suitable soil type over an extensive area that um, can house, you know, probably up to a couple of hundred wombats. There's lots of little areas that seem suitable, but just not big enough to have a self-sustaining population. Um, so that's probably the biggest task at the moment. And um, I know historically it's it's been really difficult to identify suitable areas for translocation for this species. Hmm. So soil is important. And I believe you're actually heading out to one of the sites tomorrow to uh, carry on with some of this work, looking at characteristics of that soil profile. Um, what's some of the new technology that we can bring to that question? Yeah, sure. So I am heading off to Richard Underwood Nature Refuge tomorrow, um, just doing an information collection trip uh, for a new project that we're going to do down there where we're going to use some new technology in the ground penetrating radar space. Um, so AWC with the Wombat Foundation and DES are going to contract some experts in this field and we're going to get them out onto site and we're going to get them to use their fancy new radar technology to scan the ground basically and it can 3D map the burrow systems that you know, are below ground that are very difficult to determine extent or depth from above the ground. So this new technology um, will be a game changer in terms of the knowledge of what we can find out about the burrowing habits and structure for northern hairy nose wombats. Um, to date, there's been no work done at Runner in terms of what the burrows look like. And we think that they could potentially be quite different to what they are at Epping Forest National Park purely because 
the sand profiles or the soil profiles are, are different between the two locations. So um, Epping Forest basically has a more sandier substrate, which is um, more prone to collapse because it doesn't have the clay content to hold it together. Whereas at Runner, there's a slightly higher clay content and we find that the burrow collapse is, is a lot less there. And I, I guess we don't know, but there may be an assumption that they may not have to dig as deep a burrow to, to get that structural integrity. Um, and another difference is that at Epping Forest, burrows are often associated with bohemia trees and burrowing in around the root system of that to create some integrity um, within the sidewalls. But at Richard Underwood, um, we don't seem to have that correlation with, you know, big tree root structures and their burrows. So, um, yeah, this, this uh, project should give us a lot of information about how wombats dig their burrows, how deep do they go, how, ex how extensive are they. Um, and that information is good to know, but it also feeds into when we do future translocations, we can determine what wombats like in terms of a burrow system and we can maybe help them out in pre-digging some burrows for them to go into upon translocation and know that we've used the best information possible to dig in a certain design that they're going to like rather than maybe something that they might not like. Wow, they're, they're, they're really being looked after having burrows pre-dug for them um, <laughs> in advance of translocation. That's, that's going to a lot of effort to try and make sure this operation will work. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about as few as the 300 individuals, um, you know, when we go back to when the Runard Richard Underwood translocation happened, um, you know, there was a lot less individuals, you know, 13, 14 years ago. So if, if, an, if an animal's released into an area without as best conditions as possible, if, if one or two unfortunately don't make it, you know, we're talking about a percentage of the entire population in the world. Yeah. So to make sure every individual survives is, is key. Mm. Precious cargo, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay, so, so habitat consideration is one of the main things you're looking at. And I'm assuming, you know, vegetation and the right sort of um, broad, uh, you know, food plants and all that kind of thing is taken into account as well. We've had a couple of people ask questions about this too, um, just about projecting forward, you know, where we expect climate change to affect the, you know, the conditions at both the existing sites, but also prospective sites, has that been taken to, into account? And, and how much work can we do to actually, you know, predict what conditions might be like in 30, 40, 50 years? Yeah, sure. So um, AWC has completed an internal review of the climate change analysis and strategy um, for looking at potential future properties, um, specifically tailored for the Northern Hairy Nose Wombat. So we have some uh, much more intelligent people than me looking at that. Um, and so they've been able to produce a document and we can use that, those scenarios with the most up-to-date climate information that we have. I mean, at the end of the day, everything's a, a guess because we don't know how bad or not bad things will get. Um, but that's taken into consideration. There's many, many different um, options and outcomes that happen depending on what we plug into that information. Mm -hmm. But based on the predictions, um, it looks like for the less extreme conditions that will occur, the further south we go in the historical range for the Northern Heron as Wombats seem to be more ideally suited for long range projections. Okay. And yeah, and I think in that work, there's kind of different, as you say, uh, different scenarios. So there's like a high warming scenario, mid-range warming scenario, and so on. So we can actually be quite specific about what sites are, you know, give them the best chance to be resilient in those populations going forward. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, we have to look long-term for something like this. It's it's not a 10-year project. It's not a 20-year project. This is potentially something that we can look that has no end date. And we don't want to you know, move animals of such a critically endangered nature into an area that um, is subpar, I guess. Um, we're looking for the best case scenario with mm -hmm. the information that we have at the current time. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions that have been sent in either while we've been talking or that people sent in when they registered. And I'm lumping a few of them around this theme, but uh, just the genetic health of the population. Is there a risk of 
um, a population bottleneck where the genetic diversity decreases so much that that in itself becomes a risk? And how do we mitigate that when we're looking to establish new populations? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's definitely a risk in terms of such low numbers. Um, you know, back in the early 1980s, the population estimate was in the 30s. So we've gone from 30 up to over 300. Um, as, as far as my knowledge goes, that there has been no known genetic illnesses, deformities, uh, susceptibility, to, susceptibility to disease that we know of in the population. So they seem to be faring quite well um, coming from such a low stock to begin with. Um, but moving forward, uh, it's something that we definitely have to take into consideration and conducting the hair census, which occurred at Epping last year. Um, that's how they get the population estimate based off the genetics from that. Um, moving forward with new translocated populations, we can really be picky and specific about what individuals we want to translocate to maximize, continue maximizing that genetic diversity and, and not really putting close relatedness animals together that will reproduce. Um, it's, it's difficult because like I said, we did come from a very, very low starting point of about 30 individuals. Um, but technology has advanced to a point where, you know, we can make some pretty good decisions about what animals we want to mix together. That's great, Andy. Good luck with your trip tomorrow down to Richard Underwood. I know there are lots of questions here and we're happy to provide more information about this, but I would direct you to AWC's magazine, uh, Wildlife Matters. We've had a couple of articles on this, uh, this project and this species over the last two years. So you can read a lot more on our website, australianwildlife.org, or by clicking through to Wildlife Matters and looking at those previous editions of the magazine. Sign up at the website as a supporter to receive that. It's also available online. So you can read all of those articles at australianwildlife.org, including lots of coverage of the translocations. We're going through a, a very busy period of translocations at the moment. Thank you so much, Andy, for telling us about your work with the Northern Hairy Nose Wombat and how AWC is helping to conserve it. No worries. Hope everyone enjoys wombats. For people who are interested in helping out with AWC's conservation work more broadly, you can make a donation. They're tax deductible at australianwildlife.org. There's a button at the top where you can make a donation to support work like this. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about our work with the Northern Hairy Nose Wombat. Thank you for all of your support and we'll see you next time.